Thank you so much for joining me today on Just Praise Him Radio. I'm your host, Linda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's the show. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio show. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and today's podcast is a little different. Uh, This is a special word for mothers podcast that I had no plan to do. I actually was writing a podcast about RISPA, and the Lord gave me a word. Please ignore my fat little dog snoring in the background. Okay. When you are interceding for your lost loved ones, do you ever feel like maybe you're just wasting time? Do you feel like Rizpa, like you're just covering for the dead? Does it feel like people that you're interceding for are just kind of a lost cause? Do you wonder if the Lord is really listening? Well, he hadn't answered yet, so that's a legitimate question, right? We've all been there, haven't we? We keep praying because we're told to pray and because these are people that we love and care deeply about. But inside, sometimes our faith wanes a little bit because it's been so long that we've interceded. We really don't see anything happening. I mean, there are people I've interceded for for decades, y'all. And sometimes we're watching them and they even get worse. And we are so close to the end that it's, it's frightening. We're frightened for them. We see what's happening to them And we see what's coming in the world, and and we don't know how to make any of it come out right, do we? On today's podcast, we're going to revisit Rizpah in the Old Testament. I did a show about her a long time ago, but I'm kind of fascinated with her. And I wonder why is this story about this little concubine important enough to be mentioned in the Bible? Always be on alert. If you come across a little seemingly unimportant section of the Bible, like the story of Jabez, if it's in there, there's a reason it's in there, and the smaller it is, the bigger the revelation that may come from it. So always watch out for things like that. I cannot tell you that I have the revelation on Rizpah, but I can tell you that I will always try to find it. Rizpah lived in the time of King Saul and King David. She was one of King Saul's concubines. Smith's Bible Dictionary defines a concubine as... um, something that was assumed and provided for by the law of Moses and would generally either be a Hebrew girl bought of her father. People did sell their children into slavery back then. If they needed money really bad, they would sell their children. A Gentile captive uh, taken in war, uh, a foreign slave bought, or a Canaanitish woman bond or free. Um, The rights of the Hebrew girls bought bought of their fathers or Gentile captives were protected by law in Exodus. But a foreign slave that was bought was unrecognized and a Canaanitish woman was prohibited. Free Hebrew women also could become concubines. There's an interesting story about some of King David's concubines in the Bible when he was running away from Absalom. He had left his 10 of his concubines to take care of the palace. Absalom, who he was kind of, you know, Absalom was trying to take the kingdom from King David. Absalom was David's, I believe, eldest son. And Absalom, to get back at his father, raped all 10 of the women in a tent on the roof of the palace in view of all of Israel. When King David returned to his palace, and, you know, he knew all this, he put the women in a house by themselves. I always feel sad for those concubines when I read that story. They had to live as widows. These were young, beautiful women who had to live as widows for the rest of their lives because now they were considered too impure for the king's use, and it was through no fault of their own. The good side of that is at least they were provided for for the rest of their lives. Concubines could not get a bill of divorce like a wife could. A concubine's children were legitimate, but they may have been considered secondary in the social class uh, because they were concubine children and not from, you know, a wife. They were not legally entitled to an inheritance but were sometimes included in their father's will. But I believe back in the earlier times, like in Abraham's time, remember when Sarah had him send Ishmael away after Isaac was born? Uh, she, She said this, 
this bondwoman's child will not inherit with my child. So in effect, she had Abraham disinherit his uh, first son, who was by the concubine. And I believe at one time, uh, if not a long time, they had to recognize the order the children were born in, whether they were by concubines or by wives. Rizpah was the daughter of, I think it's pronounced Ai, but I'm not sure. She was a royal concubine. Regular men could also have concubines if they chose to. And the qualification was they had to be able to support them for the remainder of their lives. Rizpah had two sons for King Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth. I never thought too much about concubines in the past. I just kind of thought of them as baby makers for the kings in that day. But whereas wives were generally chosen as a physical mark of an alliance between two kingdoms or states, concubines were actually chosen for their outstanding beauty and intelligence and were more likely to be actually loved and desired. So Rizpah would have been both beautiful and smart. She wasn't just some side chick. There are two stories involving Rizpah in the Bible. In one, Abner, the cousin to King Saul, takes a fancy to her, and he is later accused of having relations with her in an attempt to take the kingdom. If you had relations with a concubine, that meant you were trying to take over the kingdom back then. The Bible does not specify whether Rizpah had any choice in this or whether it actually happened. In the other story that we're talking about today, the one we're talking about now, there is a famine for three years, and King David inquired of the Lord about it. The Lord told King David the famine was due to King Saul breaking the covenant made with the Gibeonites. When he tried to, he tried to exterminate them. King Saul, because he was so zealous for the children of Israel and the children of Judah, he wanted to kill all the Gibeonites, so he tried to. And so King David went to the Gibeonites and he says, Hey, sorry, what can I do to make this right? And they said, Give us seven sons of King Saul. And, you know, who did all this to us? And so, of course, David does not choose any of the sons of Jonathan because they were in covenant. What he does do is choose both of Rizpah's sons among the seven. So here's poor Rizpah, who's now widowed with King Saul dead. And now her sons are to be hanged too? I cannot even imagine that poor woman's anguish. I cannot even comprehend that level of grief. She had nothing left. So after they are executed by hanging, their bodies are left to rot shamefully out in public as part of the punishment for something they themselves did not even do. And it's, it's just more than Rizpah can stand. So she starts a vigil. She spreads sackcloth on a rock, and she stays on that rock fighting off every type of devourer from her precious son's bodies. Night and day, she fights him back. Rizpah did for her sons in death what she could not do for them in life. She protected them. Concubines had basically no rights. Okay, so I'm going to read to you from 2 Samuel chapter 21, starting in verse 9, this whole story. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord. And they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of barley harvest. And Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock from the beginning of harvest until water dropped upon them out of heaven, which I think, y'all, was about six months or something. And it was from spring until, like, fall harvest. And suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. And it was told David what Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. And David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh-Gilead, which had stolen them from the street of, of Bethshan, I think is how you say that, where the Philistines had hanged them, when the Philistines had slain Saul and Geboah. And he brought up from thence the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, and they gathered the bones of them that were hanged. And the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, buried they in the country of Benjamin in Zela, in the sepulcher of Kish, his father, and they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God was entreated for the land. Okay, so Rizpah was bold, wasn't she? She was bold. Boldly intercede. Pretty bold to go and pray over the dead. I mean, that's serious boldness there. But how many of the people that we pray for are dead in their trespasses and sins? How many are dead in their addictions if God doesn't save them? So a long time ago, years and years ago, 
the Lord pointed out this verse to me to pray over my children. Psalm 126, 6. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing, which means to lift up, which is what we do in intercession. We lift up those we love before the throne of God. Precious seed, which is zirei, meaning seed or child. That means child. Did you know that means child? Shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, meaning seed or child, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Seed here is translated child in some verses and clearly indicates children or offspring in others, like in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. That's the same Hebrew word for seed. Hebrew 22.33, Zerah. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. That verse is is, of course, the Lord cursing the devil for tempting Eve in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 12, 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Obviously, Abram's seed were his children that would come after him. Okay, now, Genesis 37, 7 is the first mention of sheaves, which shows sheaves can represent people. These are the words of Joseph sharing his dream with his brothers. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. That means to bow down. So clearly a sheaf can be a person. Okay, so I want to get that all straight so we understand what we're looking at. Having her son's bones buried with the former king's bones by the current king, was probably one of the greatest honors that could possibly have happened to Rizpah. But it did happen because Rizpah interceded for them. She kept them covered until finally the king himself noticed her anguish and her faith that more would be done for them. She could not bring them back, but at least she could make sure they were given a dignified burial. But y'all, our children are still alive. We can still intercede. We can hope for far more than poor Rizpah could. Those loved ones you've been praying and praying and praying for, the Lord has a word for you mamas today for all us mamas. I was just writing this podcast and all of a sudden he gave me a word for us. I know you're tired and I know you grow weary of going before the throne again and again and again and it feels like nothing is happening. I know what that feels like. You feel like you've carried your sheaves in there again and again and you keep coming out empty handed. And sometimes you wonder why you bother to use your time to do it. We know we are to do that, but, I mean, we're human, right? There are people that we've just been wearing ourselves out in intercession, you know? And y'all know what? I was that person in the past. A lot of people who knew me lifted my name before the throne day after day after weary day, carrying me as a sheaf before the Lord and asking him to save me. And I'm sure there were some of them that were like, Lord, can you save this chick? She looks like a lost cause to us, but we know you're God. And you know what? He answered them. He did save me. Nobody would have ever. (laughs) They thought they'd be doing good if I would even get saved. They would never have dreamed. Even my mother, who had so much faith, could never have dreamed that out of all her children, she prayed for one to become a preacher, that I would be the one. We would all bet money against that back in the day. I believe most of all, God honors mother's prayers. I believe that he has called us women, especially to intercession, because like Rizpah, we will get the job done. We will get out there in the bad weather or the good. We will spread our sackcloth on the rock, and we don't care who sees our puffy eyes and our tear-streaked faces. We will cover our children, and we will believe for him to take notice of them and of our pain and our anguish. We will believe for them to be saved. We won't give up. God gave women so much endurance. I come from a long, long, many generations long line of poor, enduring women who had incredible endurance. Y'all, we will wear out the carpet that runs down to the throne of God, and we will keep carrying our sheaves to lift up before him again and again and again because he is their only hope, and he is our only hope that they will be helped. So here's a word that God gave me for us. This is a word for all the mamas. There are some mothers that on this Mother's Day, you are going to begin to see the change you have long desired in your children. And the Lord says to you, woman of God, 
Lift them up even higher before me each day. Lift them up and praise me. Praise my holy name, for I am mighty to save. Mighty. I can draw their hearts to me in an instant. Can you believe me too? I have seen your tears and heard the cry of your hearts, and today I am answering you. That is a word for you, woman of God. You know this is your word. You know it is. I refuse to believe anything but that both of my children will be saved before they leave this earth. And I am standing on the inerrant word of my holy God for that. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That's us, y'all. That's for us. Claim it. Stand on it. Remind God of it. You're going to save your kids. Time is short, and the breakthrough's coming. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Jesus bless you. Thanks for listening. Y'all have a great week. Get those sheaves in there before the throne. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Just Praise Him Radio. You can contact me by mail at my new address, JPH Inc., Glenda Lomax, P.O. Box 60, Glencoe, Arkansas, 72. 72- Five three nine, or by email at jphtoday at gmail.com. JPH is not affiliated with any nonprofit organization, church, or denomination. Does your life feel like it's falling apart around you? Are multiple things going wrong all at once? Does it seem all your comforts have been stripped away? You may have entered the wilderness. Wilderness experiences are oftentimes of great discomfort and lack. Every Christian must pass through the desert on the way to their promised land. Find out how to go from surviving to thriving by partnering with God as He leads you in the path that will strengthen your faith and prepare you to step into your destiny. The Wilderness Companion will help you find out why you have been led into the wilderness. Find out the biggest hindrances to receiving the provision you need in the wilderness. Find out what the seven temptations of the wilderness are. Learn how to partner with God in His purposes for you in the desert seasons. Get your copy of The Wilderness Companion today. The Wilderness Companion by Glenda Lomax on Amazon.com in print, Kindle, or audiobook. If you ask anyone you know what the most difficult experience of their life has been, many will answer about a time of betrayal. All those called to walk the narrow path will at some point encounter Judas. How will you respond? Do you know how to recognize Judas when he shows up in your life? Can you keep Judas from bringing destruction to your life and ministry? How can you minimize what Judas cost you? Can you pass the test of absolute betrayal? Get your copy of The Judas Test, available in print and new audiobook, The Judas Test by Glenda Lomax, available now on Amazon.com. Sold out for 30 pieces of silver? In Exodus 21:32, it is the price of a dead slave. In Leviticus 27, 2 through 7, it is the price of a live one. Jesus was sold for the price of a bondservant. Precious Jesus, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, why did Judas sell his friend out so cheap? Are there areas of sin in your life you just can't seem to overcome, no matter how hard you try? Many people live their whole lives under curses, without understanding they can be free. Learn what the scriptures say about curses and why they are still relevant today. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Learn how to defeat every curse through the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. 
If you have the knowledge, you can break curses off your life and start experiencing breakthroughs like never before. In the book Loosed from Chains of Darkness, you will learn the basics of four different types of curses. Loosed from Chains of Darkness is the most comprehensive curse-breaking book on the market today. Get your copy of Loosed from Chains of Darkness by Glenda Lomax, available on Amazon.com in print, Kindle, and audiobook versions.